good. Um, welcome to the second of our Tales from the Crypt talks, and thank you again to the Islington Society uh, for hosting us. My name's Rebecca, and I'm a historian with the Tales from the Crypt project team. Um, the, Susan's going to talk, I'll introduce her properly in a minute, but she's going to talk for about 40 minutes, um, and there'll be time for questions at the end. And then Kevin Rogers from the Diocese of London will say a few words about the, the building and progress at the end. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors and to give a bit of background on the project uh, to new attendees. Tales from the Crypt is centred on the building of the former church of Holy Trinity, Cloudsley Square, a grade two star listed building by Charles Barry and which is now the Cloudsley Centre. This was placed on the Heritage at Risk Register in 2005, classed as Category A, um, meaning at risk of um, immediate loss. By 2017, the building had deteriorated further and was declared unsafe for public use. So the diocese closed the building and began the research and fundraising necessary for its urgent restoration and preservation uh, for future public benefit. The diocese aims to raise um, around six million pounds for the Clousey Centre's complete regeneration by the end of 2023, hopefully, and has already secured generous funding from Historic England, the Architectural Heritage Fund, the Pilgrim Trust and the City Bridge Trust. Running along this um, work to the fabric is Tales from the Crypt, a heritage project exploring the lives of the first parishioners of Holy Trinity to undertake historical research vital to the restoration of the building and understanding its significance and to help curate a public exhibition. This research has been undertaken by a crack team of volunteer historians and curators, some of whose work you're going to see tonight. The project began in early 2019 when the diocese was awarded a substantial grant by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, in addition to the exhibition, which Susan will tell us um, more about, the volunteer research also informed a series of free walks and an art project with pupils of New River College Primary School, all in collaboration um, with our project partners who are Islington Heritage, Art and Christianity and Islington Walks. Um, and we had additional funding from the Mayor of London's Culture Seeds Fund. As many of you will know, the volunteer teams were led by historian and volunteer um, coordinator, Dr. Susan Sked, who I'm very pleased to introduce this, this evening and who is now going to tell us about telling tales. Over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, my partner in crime in this project. <laughs> So it's lovely to be introduced um, by you. Thank you so much. And um, shamelessly saying here, for those of you who missed Rebecca's talk about a month ago, it is still available um, on, I believe, the diocesan website. Is that right, Rebecca? So uh, if you can't um, access it, perhaps you send a message. Um, that would be great because it was absolutely terrific. Right, bear with me while I just get up um, my sharing of screens. Okay, I can only do one thing at one time, so best to concentrate on the tricky bit. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, uh, and the rest of the Islington Society for allowing me to talk this evening about the Cloudsley project, and in particular, the research into the tales from the crypt. I'm very privileged to have been a volunteer coordinator on this project. Um, it's been a delight in so many respects, and for us to have reached this point where we're actually talking about the outputs and outcomes of the project is truly remarkable, given the matter of a global pandemic coming in just at the point when we were about to deliver them. So thank you all for being here this evening and for um, allowing us to resume a project that really started um, peeping up on my horizon about a year and a half ago, um, if not two years ago. I should put a disclaimer in that I used to be a former resident of Islington but nothing so hallowed as the wonderful streets and squares of Barnsbury, but um, top end of Calley Road. But um, I'm very close to all the, all the places we'll be talking about. Although I can say straight off, I am not the expert on the streets and buildings of Islington. 
This is a way that we can examine some familiar places, familiar to all of you, in a new light and find out about the people who lived and worked in those streets and in those buildings. So I have called my talk, Retrieving the Lives of the First Residents of the Cloudsley Square District. Um, and the date range is 1820 to 1855. And I rather cheekily called it Telling Tales because as we'll find out, there's the problem about telling the stories of people who lived well around 200 years ago. We get a bit too close to them and we're not quite sure whether we've got to know them properly or not. So I'll be very interested to know what your thoughts are at the end of this, whether we've we've hit the nail on the head or, or, or done some or got some misses in here. Anyway, on we go. So the project, as Rebecca has already framed it, had two post two research questions, um, two strands of history that uh, Rebecca and I were really brought in to to explore with the help of a sterling team of volunteers. So one was the story of the church itself, Holy Trinity Church, a uh, wonderful work by Charles Barry, which was opened in 1829. Um, Rebecca is now the mistress of all knowledge pertaining to the building. Um, it's, uh, it's images across history, it's placed on maps, and she shared all those outputs with myself as volunteer coordinator and with our team of volunteers. The second strand, which is the one that I was brought in to help with, was um, to understand, to research, understand and share the stories of the 178 individuals who were buried in the crypt of Holy Trinity Church between the dates of 1829 and 1854. These are the first, um, first members of the congregation, um, the amongst the first residents of Barnsbury, they're not a typical sample, as I'll come on to explain, but of course they're fascinating um, to know more about them. And in the slide you can see on, on the right, this is literally what we had to deal with. Our starting point was the register of deaths, and we have the name of the person, the deceased, their abode, which I would call address at death, when buried, their age, and by whom the ceremony was performed, so the member of the clergy who did uh, performed the ceremony. That is our starting point, um, that is our document, and anything beyond it has been unearthed by the volunteers. Volunteers, now how do you attract volunteers to a cause which essentially is closed up shop? Holy Trinity has been a closed church. Um, it is, as, as we've heard from Rebecca, a building at risk, not safe to enter it. Um, that, that picture has changed recently. So how do you create a group and gather together a group of people who are interested in the same cause and to find out more about the individuals who are buried in, beneath the, the structure? Um, shrouded in scaffolding is perhaps not the best advert um, to bring people on board, but I have to say, thanks to the Clousey Association website, an article in Gazette, um, and general uh, press release on Diocese of London website, we were able to gather together a good deal of interest and I think we started off with some 25 uh, volunteers who came on the initial training. So here's some training. We worked in partnership very closely with Islington Local History Centre and Islington Museum. Without them, I really think we wouldn't have got very far um, in, in discovering some very special uh, documents and resources pertaining to the people buried beneath the crypt. Uh, on the right, we have Julie Melrose, former archivist at Islington, who is leading the volunteers through the first training session. So getting out a whole host of images and documents for them to look at. And on the left is a rather pleasing, um, mysterious document, which is undated, quite typical of, I think, what, of, of the documents that we've all got come to expect, really, and advertising a, a sermon in the Irish language at Holy Trinity Church. So a taste of some of the resources that were available. Um, after the initial training, I was on hand to uh, provide mentoring support as we volunteers got to know the archives at London Metropolitan Archives, Islington itself, using Ancestry and beyond. So here is just a summary. Now, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the, the kind of work that is um, the works that are of use to people delving into the history of Islington. So my list of secondary school sources is short. It doesn't mean it's uh, the, 
the alpha and omega of what we consulted, but these are the key works. So Rebecca's uh, chronology of works, absolutely crucial. Kathy Ross, her wonderful history of the Clownsley charity, 500 years in Islington, which is just a brilliant, brilliant backdrop, um, background document, um, amazing research that we could really build our scaffolding on. Um, obviously, Victoria County History, Survey of London, and the rather wonderful streets with the story, um, this pamphlet that was published some years ago by Islington um, Heritage and has been revised and is an essential guide to anyone trying to work out how the names changed, the street names changed, the buildings numbers changed and everything to do with um, the complexity of delving back over 200 years. Um, and finally, of course, there's lots of fantastic research carried out by members of the Clousey Association, Association that's available on the website. Um, a couple of whose are stalwart members, of course, I poached as uh, volunteers. So on the left, we've got a run through of the kind of sources that the volunteers have been looking at. Baptism and burial registers, birth, marriage and death, death certificates, giving cause of death, where possible in the late 1830s onwards, wills, probate, census, street and trade directories, great books and vestry minutes, the British newspaper archive online, the old Bailey records online, renumbering plans that are held in the London Metropolitan Archives and Sun Fire Office insurance policies. I mean, that's just to give you an idea of what's been scoured. But in a way, our best resource is actually all around us. Um, and I've put here, we've learned from the historic streetscape because what, and I should declare my background here. I worked for 10 years as um, Blue Plax historian for English heritage. And one of the things that I find terribly eloquent about researching past lives is to actually go and find where that person lived or worked and the buildings that were familiar to them and whether they've survived today. Um, and so this was something that was just so easy to work in on this project, because of course we're talking about you know, quite a small geographical area and um, we, had two volunteer walks as the volunteers reached the end of their research last autumn, one in typical autumnal rain, um, where basically we showed each other around and we took people to our, our fellow volunteers to the places which they researched and listened to their stories. And I have to say, it really did bring threads together in a way that was, was very gratifying. I'll come on to the two stories that I um, mentioned here, William Harvey and Henrietta and Theodosia Harper. So what are we trying to get at here? We're trying to get an insight into understanding of past lives, piecing together the stories of these people um, and the stories of their families, because often the burial itself is the starting point. There may be actually not a huge amount to say about that individual, but it often, particularly with the poor little children, many of whom are buried in the, the crypt, they hadn't done enough living. But it's who they're connected with, where they lived, and the stories that surround them and that their, their background that are so fascinating. And here's one example, which our volunteer Jenny Tatton researched, Stonefield Street, number 12, home to Thomas Julian's clerk in the excise officer office in the Indian Revenue. Um, and his wife, Susanna. Now, Susanna is the one who's buried in the crypt, but Thomas had a, a clear career that one could look at. And here Jenny is looking at the sunken grave, um, which she discovered in Highgate Cemetery. Stepping back into the past, um, one of the major changes um, which the first residents of Clownsley Square and worshippers at Holy Trinity would have not recognised in the how the church looks today, how the building looks today, is of course the absence of the original pews and the changes to the galleries. And so to get an idea of how the building worked as much as anything, um, we organised a trip to see another of Barry's three churches, the one that he built at the same time in Islington, which is St John Upper Holloway. Um, and we had a fascinating time there, um, really helped uh, by the fact that Derek, wonderful picture of Derek here, discovered this marvellous bath chair um, and gave us all cause for a lot of giggles. But it, 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 I mean, it's a frivolous moment, but actually, how, when did you last sit in a bath chair? And I think it's quite likely 
a few of the residents <laughs> who we've investigated, especially the more long lived ones, that might have been a familiar mode of transport to them. Um, anyway, it, it helped bring things together once again. So just to say briefly about um, what happened with the research, um, obviously I'm showing the outputs with you now, but one of the key things was that it was meant to be used by others right from the start. It was to inspire the artwork, um, which the children of New River College Primary School carried out in conjunction with two artists from Art and Christianity. You'll be hearing more about that in the next talk next month. Um, and it was always, also always to be used um, to underpin and to inform the exhibition. Now, the exhibition, Tales in the Crypt, was um, planned to have taken place in Islington Museum and Local History Centre. And on the left, we can see the curator there, Ros Curry, leading the volunteer curators through the process of um, how to put uh, together an exhibition, how to select material, write panels, exhibition panels that are of interest to the wide public, not just to us research nerds, um, to write a pithy caption, to understand your audience and to generally um, do a good job in really communicating the finer detail of the research to a wide and broad audience. So on the right is an image of one of the display cases we were in the process of putting together just as coronavirus um, hit London. Um, it was sad that we got everything done in time, but the exhibition was open for a day and a half. Some of my audience this evening, I think, did go and have a look at it. Um, but uh, yes, that, that was quite dashing uh, to everyone's efforts and commitment, really. Of course, there is a happy ending to all this. With the return of the exhibition to the Clousey Centre to the building that was the former Holy Trinity Church. And I'll come on to that towards the end of my talk. So that's the methodology, really. That's how we went about doing the project. Um, and I hope that will make you appreciate that uh, the selection of stories, who, how volunteers chose the stories to investigate and the ones we've ended up telling was really down to a couple of circumstances. One was the volunteer might like the sound of the people in, 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 um, in question. So a family of, of, of four who were all connected with the crypt or two sisters, or it was that the volunteers themselves live close to the addresses given in the burial record. So there was a connection there. I very much encourage people to choose who they wanted to research um, and rightly or wrongly, that's the way we went down. And then as we had the sort of, um, I suppose, period of abeyance um, of the last six months, it has meant that I and others of the vol other volunteers have done um, sub supplementary work to look at some more of the characters. So in a nutshell, who have we got? 178 people of which 65 um, were children, so just around a third. 36 of those children and were infants or young children under, un, who died under the age of two. 90 women, 88 men, nothing much to see there, I don't think. Um, and just looking at how the 1830s saw the most um, burials, 100 people, tailed off to 63 in the 1840s and then 14 in the 1850s. 1854 was when the last burial happened. 1855 was when there was the prohibition on burials in church crypts. Um, I'll come on to that a bit later. By contrast, a thousand people were baptized at Holy Trinity in the 1830s. So immediately <laughs> the board statistics say this is a very small selection of the people who uh, were connected with the church in the form of baptism. And we project also those who worship that. The cost of a crypt burial was four pounds, 10 shillings, and the additional cost of a memorial was five pounds, 10 shillings. And this is more than uh, the alternative, which would have been a burial in the cemetery of St. Mary Magdalene um, at the junction between Liverpool Road and Holloway Road, which is where a cemetery was open. So just for um, background information, the inmates of the workhouse would have been buried in that cemetery and paupers would have been buried there. Um, so 
this is for people who had some money to spend on their funeral. Um, so uh, that's that's um, a self-selecting sample. And just on the right, this is this wonderfully tantalizing image of the interior of Holy Trinity Church from um, 1834, because it shows people. Now, art buildings with people, images from this period are fairly rare. Um, and of course, it's those people that we want to connect with and find out who it was sitting under those bonnets in the back row of the free seatings um, in, in, the, in the nave. Um, I also would like to draw your attention to the fact that um, the pulpit is right front and central. This is a preaching house and this is where you hear the word of God. This is before the reordering that took place that Rebecca talked about um, later on in the 19th century. So Holy Trinity Church consecrated on the 19th of March in 1829 um, by Charles James Brumfield, Bishop of London. As we I hope you appreciate it now, one of three new churches in Islington promoted by the Reverend Daniel Wilson, who's Vicar of St. Mary and designed by the up and coming Charles Barry. It provided 2,009 sittings, including 858 free seats. Um, there are over 400 applications for tickets to the consecration service. Um, these applications survive in the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, and it wasn't that the house wasn't full, it's just those individuals book seats for them and their family and their servants. Um, so often we're applying for four to six tickets. The Reverend Francis Hunter Fell was the first minister. Strictly speaking, he was a perpetual curate rather than a fully fledged vicar. Um, and the work of the church was overseen by the vestry of 25 men who uh, were appointed by the Bishop of London. And the church collected rates from the local residents, which leads me on to uh, bottom right hand. This is the front cover of one of these precious rate books which collect um, details of all the people who paid their local taxes in the area around um, Cloudsley Square, in and around Cloudsley Square. Now, I've been accused of being addicted to rate books um, and I, I regard this as my greatest achievement of this project that I have now infected the volunteers with a love um, and admiration for the rate books. As somebody who's trawled around London archives for quite a few years now, um, the, the existence of a complete run of rate books from every year, in fact, twice a year, is a fantastic asset for any historian. Um, it's a brilliant record. It, the census doesn't kick in, as you'll know, till the 1840s. Um, street directory is a little bit patchy around this time, rate books. If you get people who are paying their taxes, that's that's half the battle to understand who might have been living in those houses. And I've also put in the slide the wonderful Cloudsley window um, commemorating Richard Cloudsley, without whom none of this, <laughs> this development would have been possible. Obviously, the Cloudsley trustees sold off the land to be developed. And then top right, um, part of the presentation um, of silver communion ware that was given by Daniel Wilson to each of the three churches. Um, Wilson had um, considerable income from his background, his, his family background in the silk trade um, and is a magnificent set of silver. A bit of bling is always good. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got a rapidly developing suburb um, moving from greenfields to streets within the span of the years we're talking about, the 1820s to the 1850s. So I've just given the, uh, the wonderful, really simple uh, survey of the stone field, um, which dates back to around 1800. And then the, for comparison, a map from 1841 to show the network of streets that had already grown up. Um, obviously this was to develop still further, um, but it's, it's a fascinating moment. And finally, we come on to some of the characters. Okay, so the prime mover behind a lot of these streets um, and one of the people who, uh, who bought the initial um, leases to develop the land was John Emmett, carpenter and builder who built much of Clousley Square, Clousley Terrace and other streets as well. Um, and needless to say, he was one of the first people to be investigated by our volunteers. And here is the house number one, Clousley Square, which his family after his death uh, moved into and occupied it 
occupied until the into the 1860s. So a familiar figure um, from anyone um, who's delved into Kathy Ross's history. One of the discoveries from literally mining the, the names on that list was, um, or connections, I should say, not discoveries, was William Warner Dennis, who is well known to have been uh, the builder and bricklayer who laid out Richmond Terrace, now Richmond Avenue with the amazing sphinxes. Um, but his first wife, Mary Ann Dennis, is one of the people buried in the crypt. Um, and that immediately was fascinating, I think, because we've got, we're, we're pairing together the known and the unknown. And these, these individuals, Mary Ann Dennis has been forgotten about. William uh, went on to marry again. Um, and the house that they occupied uh, in the lower end of Caledonian Road, basically under the Cali Pool is long since gone, Twyford Villa. Um, but that was quite satisfying to pull out somebody and, and the family life that they had connected with such an iconic part of Barnsley. So we've got a system of freeholders and leaseholders. And just um, bear with me if this is teaching grandmothers and grandfathers to suck eggs. But not everyone who lived in the area owned the property they lived in. And here is a very helpful rate book from uh, 1850 which actually sets out both the occupier, the left-hand column, and the um, owner or leaseholder, or um, the freeholder of the, um, the long lease. Uh, in this case, we've got John Emmett, um, and just above him, as of the first entry for Clousey Square, so that's number one Clousey Square, and just above him, you might be able to pick out Mrs. Freeman. Uh, it's actually the executors of Mrs. Freeman, but Mrs. Freeman owned many properties in, um, uh, Stonefield um, Street and surrounding um, streets as well. And she basically had a very nice living, we presume, um, uh, living uh, of independent means because of the rent uh, receipts she received from property which initially had been purchased by her husband and developed. So we move on to what we call these days the leadership team in the church, um, Holy Trinity leadership team. First of all, we've got the minister. Reverend Hunter Francis Fell. Um, this is his second home that we've identified in the area, which is Thornhill Road, number four, formerly one Albion Cottages. When he first came to the parish from uh, Berkshire and Oxfordshire, he lived in Cross Street, um, which is where he was living when his the first of his three daughters to be buried in the crypt died. Um, so he was touched by infant mortality, by child mortality, and um, did not actually preside over their interments in the crypt that would not have been um, uh, fitted with current practice. But his connection is clear, his, his personal collection, connection to those buried beneath the church. And then we've got Fell's long serving church warden and friend, um, Henry Buckler, who lived up the road um, in Thornhill Road um, for much of the time, but also lived um, in Liverpool Road as well, um, in Clousley Terrace. I'll come on to the exact location of Clousley Terrace in a moment. Now, Barclay's fascinating. Um, he had a remarkable career as official shorthand writer, stenographer to the Old Bailey Criminal Court from 1816 until his death in 1847. You'll be pleased to know he passed the job on to his son. Um, I'm sure they were best men for the job. Um, and if you look closely at this lovely illustration from Illustrated London News, we see what we believe is one of the few portraits we've been able to locate. At uh, the bottom left hand side, the man at the desk, the sloping desk, we think that is probably Butler. Um, what was extraordinary, he sat at um, uh, busily taking minutes, taking a record, writing down the records, at many uh, famous tiles, uh, trials. Here's the McNaughton trial um, from 1843. And also he would have seen some of his fellow residents of the area appear both as witnesses and in the dock. And of course, all this is possible to find out from the fantastic Old Bailey records online. So great fun um, seeing his name at the top of these records. So who have we got here? We've got more church personnel um, because on the payroll was an organist, Beadle and Sexton, 
rate collector and the pew openers. Now of these, we'll come on to the rate collector as we move on through the tales. I want to dwell briefly on the organist. Um, now she is somebody who personally was not connected with the crypt, other than that possibly she would have played the organ uh, at the funeral services for the deceased. Um, but she's quite a remarkable woman. Um, she won the vote, the election, um, for the three new organists uh, to be appointed to the churches, Barry, three Barry churches in 1828. Uh, it was held by the Vestry of St. Mary. Um, and as you can see from the right hand uh, picture, she got nigh on 1200 votes. Second behind her was another female organist, Miss Hind, and the third one was Mr. Banner. And they were duly allocated to the, the three different churches. And on our left, we can see the house, 108 Richmond Avenue, formerly Five Stonefield Terrace, which is where she lived with her sister, Hannah, both of whom and they're living as music teachers. But her salary of 40 pounds was pretty, um, pretty helpful for um, a spinster at that day. And um, I have to say she had to put up with a battle. There were moves to get rid of her and criticisms of her style of playing. Uh, but she actually stood her ground um, and she does carry on into the 1840s as organist um, and she dies in 1863. Now on to some people who have made it into the history books, let's put it like this, or at least one of them has. We have the brothers Goff. Um, and when our researcher first looked into them, I was very sceptical that these two were related. Um, call me a snob, but it just shows that you have to do the work to know for sure. Um, the Goff family accounts for a remarkable 10, if not 11, um, burials in the crypt, um, given their extended family. Um, Alexander Dick Goff, the architect, uh, several of his children are buried in the crypt. And also his father, Alexander Goff, who we can, whose house we can see here on the right, 154 Barnsbury Road. And also his um, sister-in-law, Harriet Goff, married to his brother, John, who is a baker of long standing at 118 Cloudsley Road, literally um, uh, just the end of the street from Holy Trinity Church. And I think this is quite fascinating, not only because of the collective grief that the, the, the two um, brothers must have carried with them and associated with um, their time living in this area for, for so many children to have died and to be buried there, but also it tells us something about the practice of being an architect. Alexander Dick Goff formed a really successful partnership with uh, Rumio. Uh, you can see, uh, Islington Literary and Philosophical Institute pictured here, better known as the Almeida Theatre. And down below, we've got St Mark's Church, Tollington Park, which Goff designed on his own. So a really successful architect. His son carried on um, the, the practice. Um, and his brother was a baker. And I think that tells us something about class and, and, and just putting aside our assumptions that um, People couldn't um, move from different backgrounds because um, it wasn't well, it wasn't the great divide between the trades and the white collar as perhaps we are led to believe in the professions. So that's something I'll be very interesting to talk further about. It's just a, uh, I think they're a very interesting um, uh, example of how fluid um, class was at this time and opportunities were there for the making or even taking. So on to some trades because. Um, in the wonderfully dismissive way, we must remember that, um, the sh that the houses that were mostly built on the Cloudsley estate were of third and fourth class. Um, third class uh, in the residential, purely residential areas, and fourth class intended for shopkeepers and trades, such as this house in Cloudsley Road, um, formerly Barnsbury Road. This was home to George Lovejoy, greengrocer, and his wife, um, Diana Piggott, as I've put. Here, neither of them were buried in the crypt, but two of their sons died before their fourth birthday. Um, George Lovejoy was, I think, a bit of a cheeky chap, according to the volunteer who uh, researched him. Uh, got a little bit tangled up with some sharp practice, possibly, um, but actually retreated to a pub um, nearby the Thames, so a long way from Islington. 
And then here on the right, we've got um, the first occupant of number 10 Gibson Square, Henry Tarrant, who was a silk manufacturer who had a number of warehouses and was the first occupant as the rate book entry um, shows. We've, it's interesting, his initial, the, the number in the column next to his name suggests that uh, the rent was going to be 28, but it was raised to 30. I don't know whether they saw him coming or um, it had some extra furbelows in the house um, when it was finished. And of course, I'm pleased to report there was also an umbrella maker in Cowsey Square, but um, all, all very helpful. Now on to the pub. Uh, sadly, I was rather hoping we might, if we'd be able to meet in person, we might just be able to continue our conversations in the pub afterwards this evening. But hey ho, that will have to wait for another time. Um, two pubs that are connected with the burials. Uh, on the left, we've got what's now the church on the corner, the former King's Arms where Samuel Woodford, who's buried in the crypt, was landlord into the, until 1835. And then on the right, we've got the regent, uh, formerly the prince region, where both husband and wife um, uh, were landlord and landlady um, and are buried just a short way away in underneath Holy Trinity. Oops, sorry, apologies. Now, here's my sort of um, what I, perhaps expected to find um, uh, the, the, the burials to have consisted of white collar work, the clerks of Barnsbury. Stereotyping, I know, is shocking, but there are quite a few of them. Um, and this is a conservative estimate that there are 13 um, families who somehow um, at one point uh, earned their living from clerking um, who were connected with people buried in the crypt. I give you the beautiful example of um, uh, the Sneeze, um, and don't sneeze at that point, Frederick Snee, um, who followed in the footsteps of his father, Edmund Leonard Snee, um, both of whom who served as secretary to the Regent's Canal Company. Um, and Snee lived in Right Bang, 26 Pounsley Square. Um, so just shows, um, I suppose, that the, the developing connections, the connectivity of the canals were we, we sort of almost put to one side given the the rapid development of the roads and the railways but my goodness that was very important throughout this period um, and um, it's very interesting that uh, Snee is there living in the square and just to give you an idea of the kind of um, employers that these clerks worked for We've got the East India Office, we've got the Audit Office, we've got the Bank of England, we've got nameless banks, and then we've got some commercial clerks as well. Um, all of whom would I have walked or possibly taken the omnibus down into the city of London um, or to their offices um, in Westminster. But we have some more further flung individuals, uh, merchants and mariners. And I give you the example of the fairs of Stoneville Street. And I just want to, this is a, a, a pricey really of the kind of information that the volunteers have pulled together. Um, and it's connected um, with Thomas Fair. So I realize I've got a typo on that. It should have been Thomas Fair and Thomas Morgan Fair. Um, apologies for that. Both of whom connected with Captain Thomas Fair merchant mariner who sailed in the good ship Esther uh, from a Porto out to Demerara, modern Guyana, British Guyana, um, but sadly died um, soon after arrival. The next stage of the fair's journey, they lived in Stonefield Street in the 1830s to the 1840s, and then um, we're not quite sure of the, the nature of the merchant business that um, uh, Fair conducted Charles James Fair, but he dissolved the business and moved with his family, took his family to Cape Town in modern day South Africa. So a family grave is out there in St. Saviour's Anglican Church Cemetery um, in the city of Cape Town. Um, and it just shows that the, the journeys that some of the residents from Cloudsley area district took. And some more unpalatable um, discoveries with the absolutely extraordinary and indispensable uh, slavery, slave owners database that University College London, London have put on the website, uh, amazing piece of research. It's now possible to look names up. Um, and here are two individuals who we discovered living in Clowsley Terrace, which is now Liverpool Road. We've got 
um, Macintosh, who owned um, Andrew Macintosh, who owned plantations out in West India, and Bertram Peter Lispinas, who owned plant plantations in British Guyana. Both of them um, directly or indirectly received compensation after the abolition of slavery in the 1830s. And both of them connected with the crypt. Macintosh has children buried there. Um, three of his 10 children are buried there and Lespinas and his wife are both buried there. Now here's one that bucks the trend really, a master and servant here. Now, William Crouch was another one of these merchants who lived in Clowsley Road, 132. He left the usual bequests to his old school, Christ Hospital, and to the local, the newly founded parochial schools. And his wife, Lydia, found the extra five pounds, 10 shillings to uh, erect a memorial in the church in affectionate remembrance of his sterling worth and many virtues. What's fascinating is that um, 15 years later, his servant and Lydia's servant, Mary Walker, requested to be buried there too. And as I put here in the quotation, near my late revered master, William Crouch, and she bequeathed the mourning ring to Lydia Crouch, her, her, her mistress, which I think is quite a fascinating thing. It is the only example we've found um, and rare. It's notable she's unmarried and presumably didn't have other family, but she leaves the will um, nonetheless. Okay, we've had all sorts, but it's now the time for the scandal. Now, I wish I had an image of uh, Robert Aldershaw. He's the old senior Aldershaw. There are two Aldershaws who are major characters in the history of St. Uh, Mary's. Um, Robert Aldershaw was a prime mover in the development of the Cowsley estate. He was clerk to the parish and actuary to its Lincoln Savings Bank. But as I put here, one Sunday morning in 1838, he was discovered dead at his home, the mansion house in Lower Street, now Essex Road. He'd taken his own life following the discovery of embezzlement at this Lincoln Savings Bank. And one casualty from this theft was Miss Elizabeth Clement Clementia Chick, another resident of Liverpool Road in the Clowsley Terrace, and she lost 14,000 pounds. And I thought you might all like this um, uh, wonderful quote from the examiner, who, um, dare I say it, there was, um, the parish of St Mary's attracted quite a lot of controversy and that's a talk for another day but I think they were very gleeful that um, at seeing somebody so highly respected um, brought down. Never in fact was more confidence reposed and misplaced than him. Um, a, a tragic tale and one that was a bit hushed up Aldershaw Sr. was buried in St Mary Magdalene Cemetery and his son succeeded him both as clerk to the parish and at actuary to the Islington Savings Bank. With the reopening of the LMA, I'm hoping to have a look at the Islington Savings Bank records to just see whether any, how much money was stolen or was it all made up according to the newspapers. I doubt it. And on to the next mystery. And this is the one that um, has, I think, grabbed all our attention. The mystery of uh, Malvern Terrace, how to interpret a suspicious form. So we have this lovely overgrown garden um, in uh, nine Malvern Terrace, formerly three Malvern cottages, which is the home of the sisters Henrietta and Theodosia Rice, who both married, in turn, the attorney at law, Jeevan Harper. And on the right, we have a memorial to both sisters. Henrietta died in 1838, and Theodosia died just two years after. Very sad, and I know that memorial um, and the fact there was two sisters attracted the, the volunteers who researched these lives. And they uncovered a really questionable story because Henriette and Theodosia were both heiresses to um, a lordship of the manor held in Gloucestershire and bequeathed to them by their, their late father. Their third sister held the final third. And Jeevan Harper, was working for his um, Henrietta's father's solicitor in, um, in, in South Wales when he met them and would have been very familiar with the contents of their father's will. He married Henrietta and sadly she died soon after. Theodosia was already living with them in the house and within two weeks of her sister's death she draws up her will leaving everything to Jeevan, her, her doting brother-in-law. 
four, four months later, they get married. They're actually breaking the law in England and they have to go to Scotland to get married in Edinburgh because actually a law had been passed making forbidding any marriage to your deceased wife's sister. The will, when Theodosia is dies two years later, is contested, but is upheld in Jeevan's favor. We don't know who put up the memorial. I think myself, the inscription rather avoids the fact that this um, Theodosia wasn't properly married to him in, 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 under English law. And it just makes you think, what did the neighbors say? What were they discussing? Were they bothered? Did they just let it go? What is even more mysterious is that after Henrietta and Theodosia's death, the third sister marries one of Jeevan Harper's friends and dies soon after. Harper buys out his friend's final third of the Lordship of the Manor and is able to move on, find himself a new wife who happens to be a childhood friend, we think, and live in some um, pomp in, in Gloucestershire and the west of England. Now, I've told it to be salacious and entertaining, but I really don't know how else one can tell that story. And this is where our history lessons are breaking down, because how do we not veer into speculation? We don't have all the information. There's more digging we can, be, we can do. Have we found a scandal? Or is this an unfortunate coincidence? coincidence? All I would say is Harper knew the law, I feel sure, and knew exactly what he was doing when he took Theodosia to Edinburgh. Um, moving on, this is more typical of the kind of thing, uh, the burials that we found, and this is a really heart-rending story of the four little children, all baptised William Hubbard, the children of Sarah and William Hubbard, who were, who saw, who were meat salesmen in Newgate Market, um, and they suffered the loss of four of their children within the space of nine years. They lived at what, uh, White Conduit Grove, which I've put on the map, is um, Denmark Grove, since demolished. So there's no trace of their house to be seen, no trace at all. Um, but the sense of their connection with the building and the memories that building must have had for them is quite remarkable. No trace, we say, but when the volunteers um, and I went on a trip to Highgate Cemetery, here we came across the gravestone of William and Sarah Hubbard in Highgate West Cemetery. And this is something that I really need to um, sort of open up for discussion because I'd be interested in people's views. We've got the changing in de death and burial practices happening in the 1840s with the arrival of the big cemeteries, um, closure of crypts and churchyards, city churchyards to, cemetery, uh, to, to burials in the 1850s is looming. And the thing about a crypt burial, which is very hard to get across um, without actually seeing the crypt from itself, is they are hidden from view. They are interred in the crypt. There's only a handful of monuments in the church. Most of them do not have a gravestone. Most of them are only remembered really in the burial records that our volunteers have researched. So is there a desire to move on to have a burial um, where you can go and actually remember somebody rather than worshipping and praying in the church above the crypt. On the right here is perhaps one sense of an answer because here our volunteer Derek is um, reading the account of William Harvey, Dr William Harvey's burial in the catacombs at Highgate West Cemetery in 1878. Um, now Harvey was uh, unfortunate enough to survive his wife or fortunate enough to survive his wife by several decades because Eliza Harvey was uh, almost the last person to be buried in Holy Trinity um, Church crypt in 1854. And the following year, Harvey arranged for his wife to be removed to the catacombs in West Cemetery. He had to arrange a faculty, um, and it is very hard not to conclude that he wished to be buried next to her when his time came. And to discover both coffins side by side um, on our trip to the catacombs was an extraordinary moment for us all, I think. And incredibly moving. Summing up, for I feel sure I am uh, over overstretched my limit. Um, from silhouettes to stories, I've put. Um, 
here is on the left is a picture of the first iteration of the exhibition in is Lincoln History Local History Centre with these wonderful silhouettes of the, some of the pupils from New River College captured by the artists as part of their workshops. And we, we, we hit on silhouettes as a way of um, visualizing these people. We have only a couple of images of these image, uh, individuals. How can we imagine who these people were? We have their stories, but we can't see them. I think the best way is to go and visit the places where they lived, where they worked. And for this reason, um, all the research that is contained in this summary on the right hand side, uh, which will be published on the Diocese of London website shortly, has been shared with Islington Guided Walk, um, who are leading, oh, sorry, my slides are slightly out of order, leading a series of walks around the streets um, surrounding Holy Trinity Church, and now the Clousey Centre, to tell some of the stories to share with the public. Um, and now I'm reliably informed the walks are fully booked at the moment, but we have produced a wonderful leaflet that you can pick up from the exhibition in um, the Clousey Centre, which you can guide yourself. So um, I'll just go back one image to show you the picture of the exhibition. Tales from the Crypt exhibition, Mark II, which opened late in September um, in the building itself, thanks to a fantastic grant from Historic England, which repaired the roof and ceiling of the um, North Isle, it was possible to have members of the public safely inside looking at the reinstalled exhibition. I should add the museum and local history centre, just the museum in particular is still closed to visitors. Um, so not possible for them to restage the exhibition. And it's been a joy to greet members of the public um, for our volunteers to staff the exhibition every Saturday for three hours. So if you haven't come along and you're a local, please do make the trip and you'll find out more. Okay, now, most importantly, all this research is thanks to the wonderful team of volunteers who are uh, listed here, volunteer researchers and the curators who I'd just like to thank for being amazingly committed and dedicated and I think keen to do yet more work um, as the project hopefully moves forwards in the 1860s and beyond. So thank you to um, everyone who's taken part so enthusiastically. Thank you for listening. Um, I'd be very keen to have your questions, comments and thoughts. And um, it's just been a pleasure to share these stories with you all. And I hope you'll think of some of these characters when you next take a walk around the streets of Barnsley. Thank you. And I might just interject, Susan, thank you so much for such an engaging talk. But further, just like to add my thanks to the volunteers who've contributed so much, because your contribution has meant that we've been able to leverage further funding for the building. And your work is feeding directly into the understanding of the building fabric and how we go about repairing some of the um, extraordinary dilapidations. The, um, just before we go over to the questions, I just wanted to pop a couple of things into the room. And the good news, I think, I hope you'll see, is that you will have noticed that a new wrap has gone around the turrets on the west elevation. And we hope that by later this month or early November, the scaffolding on the west elevation will be dismantled for the time being. Now, we don't have the funding in hand, the 1.5 million to repair the turrets but we have at least stabilized them and we have been able to at least, well, we project that we will be able to take down the scaffolding. So it will improve the appearance of the building to no end. And then lastly, it just more details will follow, or sorry, second, penultimately, forgive me, um, there'll be a pop-up shop, we hope, in December with a charity which works with prisoners who make needlework at Pentonville and other and the objects are the extraordinary quality of design. We'll uh, send out information. It'll be a three to four day um, event, uh, which will happen in the South Isle where the exhibition is now. And uh, will just give us further use of the building, the first safe use for a very long time. And then lastly, if um, hopefully you will know that there is a further talk about 
the project and how it's progressing on the, I believe it's the 29th of October at 6 p.m. and will be on Zoom. Um, Islington Society and the Residents Association will have the login details. And we can, of course, if you contact me or Virginia Featherstone, we can forward those on. Thank you. And thank you again, Susan. Thank you, Rebecca. Brilliant bit of work. And thank you to the volunteers. Now to your questions. Shall I ask a question? Go for it, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Great talk, Susan. Um, I was a volunteer and I've learned so much new. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question is, is there going to be a next phase? Because um, as, as a volunteer, I've just been absolutely fascinated uh, learning about this period of our little corner of London. And what I'm really interested in, in finding out is what happened after the 1850s when the whole area went into decline. I think it would be absolutely wonderful to, to, um, to carry on with that sort of research and, and see if we can find answers to that question. I feel I should defer to Kevin for the official answer. <laughs> Now we, um, Nick, thank you very much for the suggestion. Um, because, um, I mean, you know, this relatively small project you know, in the big picture has triggered an incredible, a fantastic interest, you know, both by the Heritage National Lottery Heritage Fund and by Historic England. Your work has done that. And obviously further phases of work, um, we need to build in your activities and broader community activity because that helps leverage the funding out. But it also feeds in really, really valuable information into what we're doing in terms of the conservation work. So we will build further projects in, Nick, and the rest. Um, we don't have one on the table at the moment, um, but we will certainly get one, get one going. Thank you. All right. Sorry, could I just ask one? Um, and did you say, Kevin, that the the walks were fully booked? Oh, I said that. They you are, said... I think, already fully booked, um, partly because of the COVID restrictions, which has right. meant only six per walk. But I think they are having um, a waiting list. Right. So I would recommend you get a drop a line. And um, I don't want to prejudge what uh, Una and Susan might say uh, who are leading the walks. but. Right. Uh, if it was a bit of fresher, maybe we would have some more going forward and it would be it would be great. But as I say, you can pick up a map from the exhibition if you want to have a nose around. Yeah. Yes, I, I love the exhibition. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, but I yes, I just haven't been able to join a walk at the right time. So I'd, perhaps I might go and ask whichever one it is leading the next one. Might be tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, Friday. Might try that and see if there are any gaps, just in case somebody doesn't turn up. <laughs> okay, thank you. If, That's okay. If there is demand, we'll we'll fund further walks. Good, excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. You heard it here first. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> and Susan, thank thank you so much. So much information. Well done, all the researchers. I utterly enjoyed that, and I thought I knew the history around here. So it's great. Thank you. Can I, can I ask another question, which may be directed uh, at uh, Kevin with his wonderful moustache, rather than Sue Stop. without moustache? Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested to know to what purpose the church will now be uh, made. Uh, uh, now it's being, if you like, uh, resurrected. Resur yeah, it's a resurrection. I'd say come um, book in for the talk on the 29th and we'll we'll talk more in detail. I mean, you don't you don't know now. Uh, I do, but I there I don't want to give the talk which is going to is already set up on the 29th. So I'm going to 
say, please, please book on the 29th and we'll explore, sort of reveal what, what we've found out and what's, what's in hand and what, yeah, just to be secure. Okay. Thank you. A question I was thinking whilst we were looking at all these people who were buried in that period under the church, do we know whether the, any of the families that were in Islington at that time are still in Islington today? Whether their descendants are still in Islington? Is that something that we would ever be able to find out? Uh, that's a really fantastic um, question. Uh, we haven't found out so far because with um, the delights of ancestry online, it is possible to trace people, albeit perhaps not 100% reliably to the present day, and there are descendants. Um, that our volunteers have been in touch with and of some of the people buried there, but whether any of them, we haven't yet found anyone who's made it through the 190 years and is still resident. And that is just as to pick up on what Nick was saying is, you know, <laughs> everyone's raring to go and to find those stories continue, but it would be interesting to know even if they make, some of those families make the 100 year um, leap um, and not to prejudge it too much, but because of those first leases um, were up for grabs in the early decade of the 20th century, I think there's probably quite a lot of change then. Um, even if you'd held on to a bit of property in Islington, maybe that was the time to change or to buy yeah. a new lease. So that's the big question. I'm not going to prejudge it, but I think that could be a little bit of a hiccup as well as the general decline in um, fortunes. Right, Nick's, Nick's going to... Uh, can, can I just add that yeah. now we have this base data, as it were, we can build on it. And um, I bet there are still a lot of people who, uh, there are some people who, who are related to the original inhabitants. And um, we, we, we could find who those people are and that they'd maybe have yet more information to tell us about the, uh, the original people who were buried there. Well, I think that would be terrific. And one of the things that um, Islington, Islington Gazette has said it's happy to broadcast is the, the output from all this and to publicize it more widely. So I think, you know, check your name, see if you, if you believe you have long roots in the area and we'll see if, if anyone comes out that way. It'll be intriguing to know. Yes, um, but I mean, this back to the burial practices, I mean, at least with the cemetery, um, you'll know if graves been tended here, we, we don't have those clues. Um, and I, I think that means it's even harder to, to make those connections. But hopefully, as Nick says, we've got the, the data here. Let's hope we can make those connections. It would be very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Susan. It's Alison. Thanks for your um, fantastic presentation. It's been great to, to kind of listen to you and, and learn about um, all of the, the stories. I was just wondering, um, what was the most surprising thing that you learnt um, through leading this project? I think the richness, Alison, um, the richness of the stories, I... I remember those early meetings that Rebecca and I had with Kevin and thinking, mm, well, what are we going to find out? We'll get some data, we'll get some names, we'll get some baptisms, we might get some streets, but will we get flesh on the bones, literally? Will we get the stories? And that has been extraordinary. I mean, I, uh, the, 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 the case I think of is one I hadn't talked about tonight is, and I'm sorry if there's anyone here who's <laughs> Of the surname was connected to the surname Allen, but there's a John Allen who looked dull as dishwater. Really, ah, uh, yeah, well, just tick. You know, Kieran will know about this one. Um, and he sold cheese for a living. Lovely job. He left a fortune of eighty thousand pounds in his will. Nine codicils. It was disputed by his loving family, and it went to the House of Lords. And I just think this is a either <laughs> there's something in the water, New River water, um, there's something strange going on. But actually, no, joking aside, I do think the complexity and richness is there for community history, it's there for the taking. It, it needs dedication, it needs time, it needs going through these records. Um, but those stories are there, that is part of our past. And I think 
um, the delightful thing I think for us all as a collective group is to take it forward, but also to reflect on what does this tell us about the community, that past community. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Alison. And of course, Jeeve and Harper. <laughs> it does, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I think I've drawn a blank now. Is there any other questions? Oh, Kevin. Kevin. You need to unmute, Kevin. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, fantastic details. And um, just on the Rice Sisters, are they, is the Baronetcy the Dinovers? Can I say that again? The Baronetcy you mentioned in Gloucestershire, yes. is it the Dinovers? No, it's a Lord of the Manor. Um, Alison and Chris can give you more chapter and verse. Um, and they sell it, he sells it on, doesn't he? Okay. So it's... I'd be interested. And it's interesting, the coat of arms is on the, 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 the tomb as well. But um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, well, send me the details, Kevin, and we'll uh, see if it does link up. The number of times walked in there and ignored that monument. And, uh, but thank you. I think there's more to that story, actually. <laughs> I, I think if we had a jury in this in the Zoom meeting, I don't know whether he'd be convicted or walk free. I'm not sure. Circumstantial evidence. <laughs> Thank you. If there are no more questions, are there any more questions? Can I just say thank you from the Islington Society, Rebecca and Susan. That was really excellent. We're looking forward to the next one. Well, thank you to you too. And thank you very much, Susan. That was fantastic. Yes. And to all the volunteers, many of whom joined us today. You know, it really is fantastic work. Susan said that um, the time they took, but actually they did it in record time, <laughs> even though they put huge amounts of hours in. It's just amazing to turn it all around in you know, less than two years. So thank you. And I will stop recording now, but thank you all for joining us too, and see you next month. The details are on the Islington Society website and the Diocesan website.